say you can, Seth, but I said you may, if you so choose, you may stand the whole thing if you want to. That'd be great, too. How many of you ever played the game Follow the Leader? Remember when you were kids and you, for most of us, back when we were kids and they actually allowed you to have recess and PE and do things where you might possibly hurt yourself? We used to play, I remember playing Follow the Leader a lot, when, especially in like first, second grade and, and stuff like that out on the playground. And it's always neat because you see this long line of kids following the leader. But they're not really following the leader, are they? They follow the person in front of them. And so the leader may walk out here and then circle back around and walk way down there and come back. But before long, the line is just kind of cut right around the table here. Because they're not actually following the leader, they're just following the person in front of them. I guess it would help if I actually looked at my notes. If I don't, we're going to be here all day. You know, and, and, and really that's what discipleship is all about. It's about following the leader. Jesus said to his disciples when, as, as, as he was departing, he said, therefore go, and make, go and, therefore go and make disciples of all nations. That word disciples means a follower of someone. To be a disciple means you follow that person. And I think one of the problems we have in our world today is people don't follow Jesus. We follow other men who are, you know, who are claiming to follow Jesus. Guys, that's where, really where denominationalism came from. Is people quit following Jesus. They started following the person in front of them, right? But Jesus said, go make disciples, meaning to people who follow Jesus of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded. See, to be a disciple is someone who follows Jesus and obeys everything he has commanded. And I think that's very important for us. If we're going to be disciples, we have to obey the things that he commanded, the things that he taught us. And so, beginning this morning, we're going to start a series through the book of Luke. I'm not going to be preaching through Luke's gospel, but I'm going to be preaching through the teachings of Jesus in Luke's gospel and looking at what he taught and how we are to obey that, how we're to put it into practice in our lives and actually be obedient to that and really follow Jesus. Not just follow what other people have told us we ought to do, but follow Jesus. The problem with following the leader sometimes, though, is we don't, sometimes we don't trust the leader. You know, you, you read stories or you watch movies and you see, like, for instance, in, in military campaigns, in wars, when somebody has, uh, uh, somebody is promoted to a captain or, or, and I don't know all the different ranks, but they're put in charge, but they don't have any experience. And the people that are under them are real hesitant about following this guy into battle when he's never been in battle before. And that experience is very important. And so we don't always want to follow somebody that's never walked in our shoes, they've never done our job. You know, when I was working in the medical field, I did cardiac and vascular ultrasound. It was such a new field at that time. The doctors didn't have any experience with it. None of the radiologists had experience with it. Nobody did except those of us who actually did it for a living because we were, you know, the first ones to do it. And it was always frustrating to have someone tell us how to do our job when they had no idea what our job was. But yet there are leaders. And so we don't like to be told what to do by people that don't understand who we are. When we're raising our kids or when we were kids ourselves, did any of you when you were teens and your parents were telling you don't do this or they were telling you you need to do this, did any of you ever say to your parents, you just don't understand? None of you? ever? Say, okay, a few of us ever did that. How many of you, as you had teenagers, your teenagers ever said to you, you just don't understand, Mom. You don't understand what it's like, Dad. You just don't understand, as if we'd never been there before. But we don't like following someone's rules or, or commands 
when they don't know what it's like for us. And when we start looking at the teachings of Jesus, Jesus teaches us some really, or gives us some commands that are kind of hard. Like, love your enemy and pray for them. And when Jesus says to love our enemy and pray for them, I don't think he means, Lord, please let a building fall on this person. <laughs> because we're to love them. And that's hard to do sometimes. Jesus says we are to do things like leave everything and follow him. To take up our cross daily and follow him. And a lot of times we read these teachings of Jesus and we think to ourselves, Jesus, I know what you're asking me, but, but you don't understand. You don't understand my life. You don't understand the temptations that I go through. You don't know what it's like to be Lance in the Quad City, Illinois in 2016. And so when we start to look at the teachings of Jesus that we need to follow, the first thing we need to understand is the very first thing he taught us was, yes, he does know what it's like. I want to ask you to open your Bibles to Luke, Luke chapter 4 this morning. We're going to be in Luke chapter 4, the first 13 verses. It's on page 727 if you're using the Brown Pew Bibles. Because... The first thing he has to teach us is he does understand what it's like. You know, we hear these things that he teaches and we that he teaches us, and we say, Lord, but my body wants something different. And my you know, and, and I tried to find a term that ex, that expresses this other part. We we all have this physical body, right? And everybody understands our physical body, you can touch it, right? Do it like that. Okay, you know what I'm not, the body. And then we have whatever it is that's in us that moves us and guides us and everything. And if I say that's our spirit, then immediately we think of our spirit in a relationship with God. If I say it's our soul, we think of that in a relationship with God. So I, I don't really know what to say because I want us to, to think about the fact there's something in us that motivates us that is not necessarily going in God's direction. You know what I mean? Sometimes our physical body wants stuff that, that is not like what God wants. Sometimes our inner, whatever it is, our, uh, the force. That's what, the force within us. <laughs> That's good. The force within us wants things that God doesn't necessarily want. And so when we read the teachings of Jesus, we think to ourselves, but, but Lord, you don't understand this physical body that I'm in that's driving me to do these other things and this force within me that's driving me to do other things. You don't understand that. So the first teaching Jesus says is, I do understand it because I had that physical body and I had that same human force within me. I know what you're going through. You know, the struggles that we go through, the temptations. And I've come across this really neat uh, de definition of temptation this week by a, a guy named, I think it was T.R. were his first initials. His last name is Applebury. He was a professor at Pacific Christian College years ago, uh, way long ago, like 1963, you know, the year I was born. We went to a, a fundraiser for my niece's softball team yesterday and this lady walks up to me and she says are you here for your grandson grandchildren i said no i'm from arkansas i'm married to one of these girls anyway that, i didn't really say that but i thought about it but anyway Appleberry, this was his definition of temptation he said temptation is a trial that presents an opportunity to choose between good and evil between God and the devil. And think about it, our lives throughout the day are filled with those opportunities, aren't they? Think of the conversations that go on in, in our heads very often, you know, where we think to ourselves, you know, I should have what I desire, I should have what I need. You know, there's something that I need, and, and God would surely want me to have what I need because it's, it's a need. 
We think it's okay to cut corners with God to get a better life. That's kind of the problem with that game of follow the leader is before long you're cutting corners because you want to have a certain way of life. And God has said, but in order to have that way of life, you've got to come way out there and way back over there and come back, but before long we're just barely marching around the table. And then the questions that go through our minds, the temptation to not trust God, the questions and the conversation we have, will God really provide for me? Will He really take care of me? Can I truly trust His promise? And we wrestle with that. And it's the same thing that, that those are the same kind of temptations that the devil has been using on the sons of God throughout history. Go all the way back. The first quote unquote son of God was Adam. And if you don't, if you don't agree with that, in chapter 3 of Luke, that's how it ends. You know, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, who was the son of God. Adam was tempted by all of these questions and all of these doubts, and he failed. And then you have the Son of God represented by the nation of Israel. God says to Moses, go to Pharaoh and say, let my son go into the desert and worship me. And he calls Israel his son, his firstborn son. And that son was tempted and failed. And we'll look at some of those in a little while. And then you have Israel's kings who at their enthronement are given the name sons of God. And they were tempted, and they failed. You see, the devil has a really good track record of putting these temptations in our minds, places where we can choose to do what God has called us to do, or we can choose the easy way and give in to what Satan wants us to do. And, and, the, and the devil has a pretty good track record with that until he comes to Jesus in Luke chapter 4. First 13 word verses. And so I want us to read this. Luke chapter 4, beginning in verse 1. It says, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit. And by the way, the, the Jordan was where he was, he was baptized. Returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit in the desert, where for 40 <coughs> days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them was hungry. I understand. At the end of 40 minutes, I'm hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered, It is written, Man does not live on bread alone. The devil led him up onto a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor, for it has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want. So if you worship me, it will all be yours. And Jesus answered, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve Him only. And the devil led him to, the, to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, throw yourself down from there. For it is written, He will command His angels concerning you to guard you carefully. And they will lift up their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered, It says, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. And when the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him until an opportune time. I want us to look at these temptations. You notice at the beginning that Jesus was tempted with food when he was hungry. Satan doesn't wait until after he's had a meal and then tempt him with food. He tempted him with food when he was hungry. The devil knows what we are hungry for. And he puts those things in front of us all the time to see if we will go get into them. He uses what we desire. And, and you know, the devil's statement, he says, if you are the Son of God, that can also be translated, since you are the Son of God. And that really just makes the temptation that much greater. 
You know, in Matthew chapter 7, verse 7 through 11, Jesus tells the story, you know, if one of your sons asked for a loaf of bread, would you give him a stone? And he goes on to say, and if you who are evil will give your sons bread, how much more will the Father in heaven give bread to those who need? And, you know, and so there's this, you know, contrast between a bread and a stone, and, and the devil says, you know, there's that stone. All you got to do is say the word, and, and your Father will turn it into bread. And it's so easy to say, you know, well, surely God would want me to have bread and not a stone, right? Right? I'm hungry. I haven't eaten for 40 days. Surely my loving Father wants me to have bread. And I am the Son of God. I can do it. But God has said, man shall not live by bread alone. The, the temptation that Satan puts in front of Jesus here is one that, that you hear all the time these days. People that say, surely God wants me to have this or to be this way. People that find themselves in a hard place in their marriage, you know. And marriage has hard places every now and then, doesn't it? And you hear people say, you know, well, surely God wants me to be happy. Any of you ever heard people say that? And what they mean is there's another option out there. You know, right now my marriage is a stone, but surely God wants me to have bread. Surely God wants me to be happy. Surely God would want me to leave this place of misery and go into this place of happiness. Jesus says, no. God wants you to trust Him. Be faithful to Him. Abide by His Word. That's the temptation. <clears throat> and again, as the Son of God, he could have changed it. It's easy. I mean, this guy walks on water. He tells the wind to stop blowing, and it does. I would give anything to have that ability. Thursday night, I'm hunting. Deer coming by everywhere down there. The wind's blowing this way. They walk out, they smell me, and they run back off. I would love to be able to say, stop. It doesn't work. Anyway, that's a totally different, different thing. But it's a temptation I have. Jesus spends 40 days fasting. And that's similar to what Israel did, the other son of God that was tempted in the same way. They were tempted, they were led in the wilderness to, to be hungry and thirsty to see if they would learn that God does not live by bread alone. I want you to turn with me to Deuteronomy chapter 8. It's on page 131 in the Brown Pew Bible. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 21. That is not correct because there is not a verse 21. It's verse 2. Chapter 8, verse 2. Let's just start reading in verse 1. Be careful to follow every command I am giving you today. And notice, that that's a theme that we're going to see over and over again. Follow my commands. Teaching them to obey everything I have commanded. There's an importance here for us, church. Be careful to follow every command I am giving you today so that you may live and increase and may enter and possess the land the Lord promised on oath to your forefathers. Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the desert these 40 years to humble you, to test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep His command. Israel failed that test. The nation of Israel failed that temptation. The Son of God, Israel, failed that temptation. But Jesus did not. Jesus passed the test that Israel had failed. The second temptation that's in here was like Israel's temptation to not follow any other gods. In Deuteronomy, while you're there, flip back to chapter 6. Verse third, or beginning in verse 10. Deuteronomy 6.10 When the Lord your God brings you into the land He swore to your forefathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you 
a land with large flourishing cities you did not build, houses filled with all kinds of good things you did not provide, wells you did not dig, and vineyards and olive groves you did not plant. Then, when you eat and are satisfied, be careful that you do not forget the Lord who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Fear the Lord your God and serve Him only and take your oaths in His name. Do not follow other gods, the gods of the peoples around you. For the Lord your God who is among you is a jealous God and His anger will burn against you and He will destroy you from the face of the land. They are not to ever follow any other gods. But it's the way Satan puts it, the way the devil puts it so often is, and you know, Jesus understood that his road to Messiahship was going to be hard. It was going to be filled with self-denial and suffering. But that was the path that God had set him on. That was what he was supposed to do. The devil comes up and says, you know what? There's an easier way. There's an easier way that doesn't require all this self-denial. It doesn't require all this suffering. Take the easy route. You'll get the same thing basically in the end. Just take the easy route. How often do we hear those same words <laughs> in our head? No, just take the easy route. But where Israel had failed, Jesus passes. And then the third temptation reflects Israel's testing of God in the wilderness. Over in Exodus chapter 17, it's on page 52. Exodus chapter 17, the first 17 verses. The whole Israelite community set out from the desert of sin, traveling from place to place as the Lord commanded. They camped at, Rep at Rephidim, but there was no water for the people to drink. And so they quarreled with Moses and said, Give us water to drink. Moses replied, Why do you quarrel with me? Why do you put the Lord to the test? But the people were thirsty for water there, and they grumbled against Moses, and they said, Why did you bring us up from Egypt to make us and our children and livestock die of thirst? And then Moses cried out to the Lord, What am I to do with these people? They are almost ready to stone me. And the Lord answered Moses, Walk on ahead of the people, take with you some of the elders of Israel, and take in your hand the staff with which you struck the Nile, and go. I will stand there before you by the rock at Horeb. Strike the rock, and water will come out of it for the people to drink. And so Moses did this in the sight of the elders of Israel. And he called the place Massa and Meribah because the Israelites quarreled and because they tested the Lord, saying, Is the Lord among us or not? Is the Lord among us? Is He really going to take care of us? Is He going to provide for us? Is His promise going to be true? And I want you to think about this. When God delivered Israel, where did He tell them He was taking them? To the promised land. And if God says, I'm taking you to the promised land, is He going to do it? Yes. Because God is a faithful God. Is, and if He's taking them to the promised land, is He going to let them die of thirst in the wilderness? No. Is He going to let them starve to death in the wilderness? No. Because if God says He's going to give His people something, that He's going to lead His people someplace, He will do that. The problem is sometimes we begin to doubt. Is he really there? Is he really going to protect me? Is he really going to provide for me? And so we grumble and we test and we question. We, and, and I wrote this down as I was, as I was making this. Note. You've heard the, the expression trust but verify. And I think sometimes that's where we are with our faith too. We want to trust God, but we want Him to prove Himself so that we can verify it. But trust, yet verify, is not a biblical understanding of trust. Trust, in biblical means, you, you trust. Whether He verifies it to you or not, we trust. 
And that's what Jesus does. And that's why Jesus passes <coughs> the test. Again, he knows the path that he's going to be on, the path to his Messiahship. He knows, he understands it will be self-denial, it will be suffering, and ultimately it will cost him his very life. But he does it because he trusts that what God said, God will bring about. Jesus understands, guys, the struggles that we have been through the struggles we have today. He understands the temptations and the questions. He understands everything that we go through. And, and what we see in this text is, is that the way Jesus overcomes this is, first of all, he relies on the Holy Spirit to withstand the temptation. And then he relies on God's Word, and he trusts in God's Word. He doesn't just know it to be able to quote it back, but he understands the truth and the depth of God's Word and His promises. And between the Holy Spirit and God's Word, he can stand secure and not give in to the temptations. When we are buried with Christ in baptism, we receive the Holy Spirit to help us stand against temptation. We also have God's Word to help us stand against temptation. We have to put those things together sometimes so that we can stand. Jesus, like all human beings, has truly been tempted in every way. The writer of Hebrews is going to say this in our study. He's been tempted in every way that we are and yet was without sin. Guys, if He calls us to do something, He knows it's possible for us to do it. And if He tells us you need to resist this, He knows that humanly it is possible that we resist that. Or He wouldn't call us to do it in the first place. Our leader knows the way. He knows what we're capable of. He won't ask us to do anything that's impossible. And therefore, he says, to teach them to obey everything I have commanded. Notice, church, he doesn't say, I want you to teach them everything I've commanded so they know what my rules are. He says, I want you to teach them to obey everything I've commanded. We're not just to know God's rules. We are to obey God's rules. We're not just to know His promises. We are to faithfully submit our lives to His promises. And so that's why we're beginning this study. Through the teachings of Jesus in the Gospel of Luke. Why did I choose the Gospel of Luke? Because I've been reading through the Gospel of Luke. And there's some really cool stuff in there. That every time I read it, it steps on my toes and offends me and makes me realize how far from the mark I am. So I'm going to share it with you so you can realize how far from the mark you are too. So that together, we can be what he's called us to be. Let's pray. Our Father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you for, for the word that tells us that Jesus left heaven and became flesh so that he could understand what we go through. He is not someone that sits on a throne in heaven and just barks out orders to lowly humans. But instead, to understand and to be compassionate, he came, left his throne, and became a man that he could understand. And now he walks beside us, and he walks with us, and he tells us, don't go there. Don't do that, but do this. And he knows it's hard, because he's been there. But that's why we can trust him. That's why we can follow him into the battles of our very existence, because he's been there before. He knows the way, and he knows what we're capable of. Father, help us to trust more fully. Help us to trust even when we don't have right in front of our faces the verification. Help us to trust. 
And as we go through these teachings and we realize how hard they are sometimes, help us to trust that even though they're hard, that we're to put them into practice. Father, we want to lay our lives before you. We want to be transformed so that we can be transforming to the world around us. You made your son like man so that you can make men like your son. And that's what we ask you to do to us today. And we ask all of this in his name. You may be struggling with some temptations and struggles this morning. You may have some things in your life that you need to let go and trust God and just surrender. And we always want to end with an opportunity for you to share any of that with us. And so Chuck's going to lead us in a song. And if there's anything we as a church can do to help you, myself or the elders or anyone else, uh, use this as an opportunity to come down here. You can share with me what's going on. I can put you with the elders or anything you need. Our goal is for us all to reach heaven. Amen? And we need to help one another. Confess your sins to one another. Pray for each other. And that's what we're here for. So if there's anything we can do for you, please come forward while we stand and sing this song.